So very, very different from the topics we've had today. Nothing about global politics, nothing about feminism, very, very different controversies coming up in this type of thing. And I decided to start off with this. Does anybody know who this guy is? Uh, Arnold Schwartz. Schwartz, yeah. He was one of the pioneers of you know basically using the internet in an ethical way, you know, open sharing of information. And he allegedly hacked into Stanford University or one of the universities, I think it was, what was it? That was MIT, and he downloaded a load of open source journals, but they said he was downloading too much and the US was prosecuting him as a hacker to kind of make an example of him, so he actually killed himself. So he's been a bit of a poster child for ethics on the internet and so on. So I thought that was quite a good way to get people's attention at the beginning. Now, this is about ethics. So, um, I'll give you a minute or so to read this little cartoon. I guess most of you are familiar with Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, so I'll give you a moment to read this. Is that this one for again? Phones. Okay, so this is an American comic strip. It's about a little boy who's got a pet tiger, a stuffed tiger, that for him it's alive, for everybody else it isn't, and he has all these adventures with his tiger. And we can see here about ethics that he's stating a certain view of ethics if it's good for me, it's okay. But when somebody else follows that same model, all of a sudden it's not good for him. So this kind of encapsulates one of the problems with ethics, that you might have your own ethical code, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for everybody else. And I thought this was a kind of interesting way of bringing this up. Now, with ethics, there are, arguably there are four main schools of thought for ethics. And you know, one of them, obviously, teleological ethics, the end justifies the means type thing, you know. I suppose that Spock would say the good of the many outweighs the good of the few, but I Star Trek geeks in the room. Um, so this would be one kind of ethical theory that people use when they're trying to decide what's ethical. Um, another one could be deontological ethics, and this is about the ethics of rules. There's a certain code that we have to follow, irrespective of the cost-benefit analysis. So some people might actually follow this code of ethics. We've got this one, rights ethics, a kind of moral absolutism that everybody has equal rights. So instead of working out what's the best way, we should draw lots to give everyone a kind of equal chance. Some people use this when they're working out what's ethical. And of course, there's a kind of intuitionism on a case-by-case -case basis. That there's no set rules, there's no cost-benefit, it's just working things in a kind of ad hoc type version. Now, different people will follow different types of ethical theories in their life, which is why there's that was on phone again. Um, is that even ethical to have your phone turned on during someone's presentation? Some people would say that's very insulting, other people would say no, it's very normal. There's no universal standard here. For China, it might be normal to have your phone on during presentations. For an Anglo-Saxon European thing, it would be the height of rudeness. There's no one universal standard. And if people follow one of these type versions of ethics, other people who follow a different one would take offense with it. So, this brings up the ethics of this. Because I'm supposed to be talking about the internet, and the NSA is actually hacking into everybody's phone calls, emails, and everything else. And they would say, in an end justifies the means type method, you know, this is actually good for them to preserve the US against terrorist attacks, except the argument hasn't been made that this actually has stopped any terrorist attacks. So this would be another type way where what they say is ethical is different from other people. Now, I was originally going to talk about this and then I decided, you no, know, I'll do something else completely different. But I just brought this up as a way of highlighting the, the, the differences that go on here. Now, how about ethics and academia in Japan? This is the, the country that I know most. It's where I've done almost all of my academic teaching. So a lot of the lessons that I'm going to draw, the points that I'm going to make, are very much based on my experiences from being a, an educator in Japan. And towards the end of this conversation, I'd like to get people from Hong Kong, from China, people who India, people who teach in other Hong Kong areas. China. Well, <laughs> some of the Hong Kong people might, might differ, but that, not, don't want to get into that argument. <laughs> Um, but I'd be interested to get some feedback from different people around the world to see if your conclusions, your understandings of this are very much the same as mine. 
Now, before I do move on, one of the points that I want to make is it's not just ethical viewpoints that change, it's over time. So people of one generation might do things in a different way from others. Like for today's presentations, for example, we've seen some really old traditional style, people reading the notes, we've seen people, no slides, we've seen people using what I call the 177 rule, one slide, seven bullet points, seven words per text. And mine, you're going to see a very, very, very modern style PSE multimedia type. They're different types and they've evolved over time. The one thing that I would say is younger generations of people are what are called digital natives. Older people in the room are digital immigrants and they don't even speak the same language. If you go one of these old style presentations, young people will be bored. If you give a presentation that suits the young people, the old people will say it's all fluff and there's no substance. So there's different opinions even within generations. So anyway, let's get to Japan. Um, it's in the digital doldrums. The educational sector in Japan is about 20 years out of date. Many, many, many of the universities in Japan don't have Wi-Fi. Most of them don't have a requirement for their students to have computers. And even at the school sector, my sons go to the local school, their idea of IT is six old Windows desktops in the library only. And we contrast that with the international schools in Japan where everybody in the whole school has got one of these. All the elementary kids have got an iPad, junior high, senior high have got MacBook Pros, they're all Wi-Fi to the max. And those kids are learning a different skill set. They're learning about multimedia all the time. And this is the main point I want to talk about today, is the multimedia usage. The younger people don't have the same respect for ownership that maybe older people do. And we're going to talk about this in just a moment. So, back to ethics then. Um, I'm doing my doctorate at London University, Distance Learning Institute of Education, and everything that I do has to conform to BERA guidelines. This is the British Educational Research Association, and there's ethics there. If I interview students, I have to do things to preserve their anonymity. If I'm doing surveys, they've got to be done anonymous online. There's a whole lot of guidelines that I have to follow. And I teach an academic writing course to many different students at different universities in Japan. I always say to them, well, you know, you need an ethical guidelines. What does your department, what does your university suggest you follow? In America, they're probably not using the British one. They've got their own ones and so on. And many, many, many of my students, and um, Brian could probably back me up on this, and he's at Todai, one of the best universities in Japan. They don't even have an ethics guideline. So it's quite problematic. Um, Google Apps, you know, this is one of the, Google does a whole load of the online things. Um, basically, last year I actually won the Google Teacher Competition and Apple Distinguished Educator Competition. Now there's a conflict of interest here. I'm doing some things for Google, some things for Apple, and they've got a strict code of ethics that the ethics department at my university has to sign off on that they have no problem with me doing the work for Google and Apple. The only problem is Japanese universities don't have an ethics department and I ended up having to get it signed by the personnel department. So the whole ethical understanding in Japanese education sector is about 20 years out of date, as indeed is the technology stuff. So you know this is the point that I want to make here, that ethics is missing. There might be ethical teachers, but there isn't an ethical framework that guides the institution as a whole. It's very much do as you like. So that, that's a major problem that I see. Now, bringing this into you know, the, the usage of digital literacy, technology, and multimedia resources, how many people here have illegally downloaded something and don't worry, this isn't being recorded for legal purposes? I guess many people have done it, right? So there's the whole pirating and plagiarizing thing going on. Now everybody in this room is an academic to some extent. You've all probably written papers and you all have to do your in-text referencing, blah, 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 inverted commas, bracket, Smith, 1979, page 20, wherever. We're all aware of this. But today in the presentations, most of the presentations I've saw today have had photographs somewhere on the slides. Nobody's referenced them. Now, the people who have already presented today, the people who are presenting tomorrow, most of you have photos and videos in your slides. Did you take all those photos? Did you buy the rights to use them? Did you download them from a Creative Commons site? My guess is the answer to most of those questions would be no, which means you pirated those images, which is in a modern digital sense, is just as egregious a sin as plagiarism of someone else's writing. 
Someone's created the image, they've created the video, just the same as they've created the books. And in a modern digital sense, you have to reference everything that you use. So case in point, this. Who's seen this photo? Mm -hmm. This was plagiarized to the max. This was actually taken by a Cuban guy called Alberto Cordo, and he got no money for this, despite it being one of the most iconic images of the 20th century, because Cuba hadn't signed some intellectual property agreement, which meant everybody in the world was free to use it, and he got no money for it whatsoever. Now, he didn't really care very much. The only time he actually made a legal complaint about this was when some company tried to use this to sell merchandise. Now, I know that you've actually got this on the side of your glasses because I saw that the other day, but well, it's very <laughs> subliminal. But there was one company who tried to market it. He took them to court and he got $50,000 compensation, which he instantly gave to help schools in Cuba, that kind of stuff, yeah? Now, in the modern world, if that had been taken, he could have copyrighted that image, which meant everybody who used it would have to pay money. Now, interestingly, Che Guevara's daughter is still alive. She's working as a doctor in Cuba. And she was asked, you know, how would her father feel about his, you know, image being in all these t-shirts? And her quote, which I thought was kind of funny, she said he would be really, really happy that his photo was on the breasts of lots of young cute women. <laughs> which is always an interesting take on it. And I did promise not to mention any feminist things, but it was a lady's his daughter's comment. It wasn't mine. Um, so, when you take an image of your own and you put it up on the internet, how do you tell people whether you're actually giving them the permission to use it or not? Now the copyright C is an easy way that it tells them it's copyrighted. But can anybody, how many people are familiar with these symbols? There's like one, two hands. Nobody knows what these are. The prosecution rests. Um, Essentially, these are creative commons logos. <coughs> and when you take your own photo, now this is one of the points, I see lots of people here with mobile phones taking photos, taking, no problem, no problem whatsoever. <laughs> now this is the thing, in the old pre-internet days, you could take anybody's photo from a newspaper, cut it out, photocopy it, scan it, put it on your PowerPoint, and have it in your slides for your presentation, and you could rest easy that it was private because only the people in the room would see it. Hey, welcome to internet connected mobile phones. You could have done the same thing thinking this is very private. Two minutes later, everybody's zapping it on their iPhone, uploading it to their Facebook. It's been tweeted out via the internet. Someone's taken a video they're posting on YouTube. And a presentation that you thought was private, it was perfectly safe to use images that you didn't take, didn't pay for, didn't use the Creative Commons. All of a sudden, photos and videos of you stealing this other person's content is now on the internet, and there could be a lawsuit coming your way from the photographer. So you as academics have to reference your material. And the way that we do this is we actually download photos which have a Creative Commons license. And that's essentially what these things are. So people who take photos, can put any one of these licenses on any multimedia creation online. Can be photos, can be videos, anything at all. Now if you look here, the top left one, attribution by, if you see this logo on any multimedia material, it means you're free to download it, to use it, to remix it, to change it, to alter it, to do anything you like, as long as you give credit to who the original creator was. Now, this one here, is a little bit more restrictive. Again, you can remix it, create it, download it, do whatever you like, as long as the new creation that you make is also reshared under the same open, allowing other people to do to theirs what you've allowed them to do to yours. Now, a little bit more restrictive is this one, which means no derivatives. You're allowing people to download your image and use it any way they like, but they're not allowed to alter it. And again, they have to give credit to you. The non-commercial means they can do anything they like with it as long as it doesn't involve making money. I think of all those t-shirts with Che Guevara, they would be ruled out of bounds because they're making money. Um, we've got this one here, um, non-commercial and share alike, which again, it bans them from making money, but the new creation must be shared under the same conditions as the original. And then the most restrictive is non-commercial, no derivatives, attribution. They can't change it, they can't alter it, but they can freely use it. 
So any one of these six icons that you see on a video, you see on a photo, you see on a website, tells you that you are freely able to use these materials within the restriction of whichever one of these things that you have saw on the, the material that you're using. So this is one way where you can make sure the images that you're embedding in your website are not going to land you in trouble because in the digital world, this is digital plagiarism or digital piracy, just the same as copying someone else's data from a book, pretending it's yours and putting it in your book. That would be the old style plagiarism. This is the new. Now, I've got a very short video clip here which kind of explains this in action. Have you ever wondered how to download and share digital content legally? How do you let people know that you want them to reuse your own work? Creative Commons licenses can help you do both. We'll show you how. Our world's exploded with digital opportunities. Now we can communicate, share, and work together using the exceptional distribution network that is the internet. Information and content can fly between us in exciting new ways. But it's important to know that when something is created, say a photo, a document, or a music track, it's automatically protected by copyright. Copyright enables people to say who can share and reuse their creations. You must always obtain someone's permission before sharing or reusing their work, even when it's posted online. But what if a creator wants everyone to use their work without the hassle of granting permission over and over? This is where Creative Commons can help. Creative Commons provides licensing tools that are free to use. You can apply a license to your work, which refines your copyright and streamlines how you give permission. Zach here downloads a photo called CC Kiwi that he wants to use in his science project. He can do this without asking Curry, the photographer, first, because she's already given permission with a Creative Commons license. Curry's license is legally robust, but easy for Zach to understand. She's told the world, including Zach, that they can use CC Kiwi as long as they acknowledge her as the original photographer. There are more rules Curry could have included. Creative Commons licenses are made up of license elements. You can think of them as rules, and each have their own special symbol. This is attribution. It means that Zach must acknowledge Curry when he publishes his science project containing her photo. This is non-commercial. It means no one else but Curry is permitted to make money from CC Kiwi. Tim wants to print the photo onto t-shirts and distribute them to friends. He can do this, but he must not sell them. This is no derivatives, and it means that Kerry hasn't given permission to change her photo. Kate can use CC Kiwi on her design blog, but will need to ask Kerry before retouching or mixing up the image. And this is share alike. It means new creations that use CC Kiwi need to carry the same license. Jack incorporates his own remix of CC Kiwi in his video installation, but he must share the work under the same terms that Kiri has. Each Creative Commons license gives permission to share and includes the attribution rule. So people who find your Creative Commons license work are automatically allowed to share it, but are required to acknowledge you if they do. The other three license elements are optional, and you can choose which ones to add, if any. Here are the six combinations that make up Creative Commons licenses. The difference between them is how many rules apply when someone wishes to use your work. The attribution license allows reusers the most freedom, and the attribution non commercial no derivatives license allows the least freedom. The attribution license and the attribution share alike licenses are sometimes referred to as free cultural works approved licenses. These three licenses restrict commercial use of a work. And these two licenses do not give permission for adapting or remixing. These two licenses require new works to be licensed under the same terms. To choose and apply one of these licenses and to view their terms in more detail, visit us at creativecommons.org.nz. <coughs> Or you can answer some questions to help you decide which license best suits your needs at creativecommons.org slash choose. So the problem is most people when they're getting images for their slideshow for anything, they just go to Google and they do a search, download the image and put it in. 
that doesn't guarantee you that the image is licensed this way. So what you should do is go to the Creative Commons search page and search for image using keywords there, and that allows you to search Flickr, Wiki, Wikipedia, Google, with a preloaded set of filters that will only bring up images which are Creative Commons licensed. Or you could go to somewhere like iStock Photo and you could buy the rights to take the images or the videos that are there. Or best of all, take your own, because of course, you've taken them, you can grant yourself permission. And look at this amazing photo here. Guess who took that? Hey, it was me last time I was here. So of course, I didn't need any permission to put this online on the website or on the poster, because I was the photographer. Now, if I then do put this online on Flickr or Google or whatever, I could then license it using one of these licenses, telling people which way you can use or reuse this or whatever. And that's what you need to do to make sure you're not committing digital plagiarism. So, in terms of slideshow then, what's missing from my slideshow? Well, here is the credits. And just at the end of a paper, where you've got a list of references, at the end of every modern slideshow to be a digital reference paper, you need the credits like telling people where did all the images come from. Now, almost all the images in my slide came from Wiki Commons. Wiki Commons is a part of Wikipedia where people upload images that they're freely giving everybody the permission to reuse, remix, remaster, and there's no problem. So I just need to say Wiki Commons, except for these two images. These were actually taken by individuals from their Flickr page. You guys know what Flickr is? It's like Yahoo's online photo storage. And these people have put these photos up in Flickr, and again, they've Creative Commons licensed them. So as a reference in style, you've got APA, MLA, Chicago. For a digital reference, you have to give the URL, which includes the username of the person, and which type of license it is, which is what I've put on here. And this one, I've decided to do something that most other people didn't do, and I've actually given credit to Alberto Corda, who took the photo in 1960. Now, anything wrong with my presentation? There's one huge glaring error. Ah, the video is from YouTube and it's made by Creative Commons, that's perfectly fine. Good guess. The, the picture of the artwork. That's Wiki, Wiki Commons, that's perfectly fine to use. No, 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 I mean the, the, uh, the that may not be internet related, but those also somebody else work. Yeah, but I took the photo, and they've put it in a public space, so that's perfectly okay. The very first one, the guy who committed suicide. No, that's from Wikimedia, uh, Wiki Commons. The presentation is mine, I've granted myself permission. Come on, what, what made you laugh at the beginning of the presentation? Uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin. I have no permission to use Calvin and Hobbes, so I hope no one's taken photos of Calvin and Hobbes, and I hope you're going to edit that part out of the video that you're taking on your iPhone. So that one thing could get me in a shitload of trouble, as they say in the vernacular, because I've put something in there that I haven't permission to do. I should have contacted Bill Watterson and said, hey, you're the cartoon guy, you made this, can I have permission to use your thing in my slideshow? This is modern digital pedagogy, it's modern digital referencing, and this is a modern world and we're operating in it. This is what the next generation expect to see in their presentations. They expect to see segments with photo, with video, with multimedia. That's what they expect, that's what keeps their attention, and we've got to build these kind of slideshows, these kind of presentations to keep them interested, and that brings up a whole new set of rules that most people are unaware of, and I haven't seen in anybody's presentation so far anything that refers to credits for photos or whatever. And one other thing regarding photos, you always need to make sure that you've got the highest definition possible so that they're very clear for people to see. And I saw some people's photos which were very blurred, which means they've taken a small thumbnail size and blown it up big to put on the screen, and it's not very sharp and not very readable. This is referencing for a next generation. This is what they expect to see, and this is as much as I want to say today. Um, last thing. So be ethical in your usage of digital and multimedia material. So, I'll shut up and I'll pass the buck to you guys. Now, quick, before you ask me your questions, how many of you were aware of any of this? A few hands going up. So this means 
where were these things in your presentations? And all those people who are presenting tomorrow, you're going to be fiendishly making credit slides. Anyway, you have to hand up first, and then we'll pass it up to him.